So in this video, we're going to talk through BLP estimation, or at least one side of BLP estimation. Maybe you've heard of BLP estimation before. It's, it's kind of become a, a canonical uh, approach in, uh, in industrial organization in particular, but I think there are, are certainly some uh, applications outside of that area. You're, you're, you're probably going to run into it a lot, though, so I just... Or, or, you will at least run into it in your research or you'll hear others talk about it. So I wanted to make sure we, we had a chance to cover it at, at a very high level. I mean, we'll talk through the math, kind of the model, but, uh, but, but really I want you to get just a high level understanding of what's going on here. And so the context here is, is a mixed logit or random coefficients model of demand for a differentiated product using market level data. So we don't have the kind of micro data that, that we've been used to using in this class, it's market level. We just see things like market shares, for example. Um, and we, uh, or, or, or rather, uh, you know, attributes of, of alternatives are varying at the market level. We have a bunch of different products that consumers are thinking about purchasing, and, and we're going to have a mixed logit model of demand for those products. And we want to estimate how the attributes of a product affect consumer demand. Uh, one of the most, if not the most important attribute to consider is price. But as we talked about in the last video, price is almost certainly correlated with unobserved attributes like quality and probably other things also that we, that we should be concerned about. So Barry Levinson and Pacus uh, in, 19, in a 1995 paper, uh, which has now become known just as BLP, use instruments to isolate exogenous variation in price. And, and this was particularly novel. It was, it was a novel method to include instruments in a non-linear model using market level data. They were they they kind of revolutionized this approach that, that, that hadn't been been done uh, previously. We're going to talk about price being our endogenous variable here, but of course we could have any endogenous variable, anything other than price, um, just so long as we had have instruments that we can use that that would be correlated with with that particular endogenous variable that we have in mind. So everywhere that we talk about price throughout this video, you can think about substituting any other endogenous variable in place. Okay, so our model here, we have data on M markets with J products in each market. Uh, oftentimes we think of one of the products as being the outside good, just meaning purchase nothing. So, so just kind of like a, a, a vector of zeros or something like that for, for all the attributes. The utility that a consumer can, obtains, uh, a consumer N in market M obtains from product J. So we've got a lot of notation floating around here. It's gonna be the following. We're gonna have a representative utility term. We're going to leave this general. This could be the, just the same kind of linear representative utility we've talked about a lot in this class, but we'll leave it general. But this rep representative utility is going to depend on the price of the product, a vector of non-price attributes, uh, possibly some demographics about individual consumers, and then a vector of coefficients for, each, for, for, for the specific consumer. And importantly, I just want to point out, we're thinking about products where you know, a product has a fixed set of attributes. And, and when you go into the store, a fixed price. So the price and the attributes are not varying across consumers, but they might vary. Obviously they're gonna vary by product. They might even vary by market. In particular price, we could think of as varying by market. Um, you know, things might just cost different prices in, uh, in Amherst versus Boston, for example. In addition to this, kind of consumer specific representative utility, we're gonna have this Xi term, Xi sub JM. This is gonna be an unobserved utility term, but note it's not indexed by N, it's just indexed by J and M. So we can kind of think about this as like the average unobserved utility of product J in market M. So let's just, just kind of on average, how much utility come from all of the unobserved attributes of a product in a certain market. And then we'll have this epsilon as well, which is indexed by M. So that's additional idiosyncratic unobserved utility. So even though we have this kind of average unobserved utility, each individual might differ from that. And, and so Xi is gonna pick up that average and epsilon is gonna pick up basically deviations from that average. So kind of in total, we have these two unobserved or random utility terms where we've decomposed things that vary at the product level, product market level, things that vary at the individual level. So the issue here is that we expect the price to depend on all attributes of a product, including those that are unobserved by the econometrician. 
But if consumers also get utility from those unobserved attributes, then price is correlated with epsilon, uh, with, with our error term. And so price is endogenous in this model. In order to solve this problem, BLP uses a two-step procedure. First, they estimate the average utility for product J and market M, including observable and unobservable attributes. So they're gonna kind of estimate on average what is the utility for a given product market pairing, and then regress that average utility on price and unobservable attributes instrumenting for price. So it's gonna be kind of a two-step procedure. We've gotta figure out what is the average utility for a certain product market. Then we can use that average utility in just a simple OLS framework and instrument for price. This will make a whole lot more sense as we keep going here. The notation is going to get a little messy. I'm going to try to not get buried in that and instead just try to talk at a relatively high level. You can always pause the video and stare at the notation a little bit if that's more useful. So we're going to decompose that observed representative utility into two components. This V bar, which is going to be like the average representative utility that's not going to vary by, by, uh, by individual. And then this V tilde, which will be the additional representative utility at the kind of like deviations from the average that we get out of V bar. And so if we split V into this V bar and V tilde, we can think about starting to rearrange terms. And now we're going to have two terms that vary at the product market level that just have J and M in their, in their subscript. And then we're going to have two terms that vary uh, at, the, at the consumer level. And so it's going to be this V bar and this Xi term. So this is kind of like average product market utility that we can observe. And then Xi is going to be average product market utility that's unobserved. Let's put both of those together into one term called delta. And then we're gonna let the, the V tilde and the epsilon be, be here by themselves, uh, you know, but keep those separate. So we can think about this delta term as effectively being a kind of like product market constant or intercept term. So we talked about having alternative specific intercepts in, in, our, in our models in the past. So we can think about delta as just being one of those kinds of intercepts. It's just varies at the product and market level. So it's not just that different products have different levels of kind of average utility, but that that might actually differ market to market. People might just prefer different products in Amherst versus in Boston, for example. And so that's what that delta is gonna be. That's gonna be a kind of product market constant term. Well, if we make two distributional assumptions, let's assume that epsilon is IID. So that's this epsilon term here, that thing's gonna be IID. And we've got these beta sub n tildes. Let's assume that there's some distribution for those things, just like we've done in the past for mixed logit. It's actually gonna be a little different than we've done in the past because we've already pulled out the mean of beta n in this beta bar. So these will actually tend to be mean zero random, random coefficients. And, and what we're gonna estimate is the variance covariance matrix. So we're gonna have the set of beta bars, which are gonna be the means of the betas and thetas are gonna define our variance covariance matrix. So now if this epsilon is IID, extreme, IID type one extreme value, then what we have here, this is essentially just like a different way to frame a mixed logit model. So we can write down our choice probabilities as mixed logit choice probabilities mixing over that mean zero density of beta tilde. So what this means, is we can use, you know, we, we have, we, we can, we, we have an expression for choice probabilities. We're going to have to simulate this thing, uh, just like we have with mixed logit models in the past. But if we knew delta and we knew the, the, the thetas that defined our distribution here, we could calculate choice probabilities. Or to put that a different way, we can use this choice probability to estimate the values of delta and theta that make our choice probabilities 
kind of in line with the observed choices that we see. So in theory, we could use these choice probabilities to calculate or to estimate all of our deltas, all of those product market constant or intercept terms, and all of our thetas, all of our variance covariance parameters. So we could do that. The only problem we've run into here is that we've actually subsumed beta, the means of the individual specific coefficients or random coefficients. We've subsumed those into delta. So we can't estimate them here. So what we're gonna have to do to get beta bar is let's first assume that that mean representative utility is linear in parameters. So we're gonna be able to represent it as beta bar times this notation is kind of weird. I'm going to use this to refer to a vector of both price and all other non-price attributes. So just think of this as one big vector of P stacked on top of X's, let's say. So anyway, if we express mean representative utility that way, now we have an expression for delta. It's going to equal this linear combination of beta and attributes plus that xi error term. And so remember, the problem that we had at the end of the last slide is we'd estimated a bunch of deltas, but we couldn't estimate betas. Well, now we have this simple linear relation between delta and beta. And so what we can do, this, is, this looks a whole lot like just an OLS regression equation. We can take those deltas we estimated in the, on the last slide, use them as the left-hand side variable, and regress them on price and other non-price attributes in an OLS regression. But remember, price is endogenous. So really what we can do here is use a two-stage least square regression, regress delta, our estimated delta on price and other attributes, instrumenting for price with some good instruments that we have. Depending on the situation, those could be different instruments. And because we're in this linear model, this is easy to do. You, you, you probably already know how to do this, how to just run an IV regression, IV linear regression. That's simple. So in theory, everything we just described is feasible. We estimate our del deltas and our thetas. We take those deltas. We use them to estimate beta bars. Now we've got all the parameters of our model and we're solved. The problem though, is that even though that works in theory, we could have hundreds or thousands of those delta terms to estimate. And that might be computationally infeasible. And so really the novelty of BLP is that they developed an alternate approach where they don't have to estimate those delta terms in the way I just described. I described estimating those delta terms as product market intercept terms in a mixed logit model, they figured out a different way to get those delta terms. And their insight was that the delta terms determine predicted market shares. Those deltas are like average utility for a product. And if that value is higher, we're gonna see higher market shares. And if that value is lower, we're gonna see lower market shares. And so their insight was that there's this kind of mapping between the delta terms and the market shares that come out of the model. And so they said, let's find the set of deltas that ends up equating our predicted market shares with our observed market shares. And so they really showed two things here. They showed that for some given set of theta parameters, there's a unique vector of deltas that will equate predicted market shares and observed market shares. That's really important because if there were infinitely many of these, then it wouldn't be helpful. But they show that there's a unique vector. There's gonna be one single vector of deltas that will actually get us the correct market shares. And they came up with this iterative contraction mapping algorithm to recover that unique vector of deltas. So they showed there's gonna be a different way to get these, del these important delta values uh, that, that's computationally feasible. 
And the idea behind this algorithm is we want to find the vector of product market constant terms, that, those, those, that delta vector that equates predicted market shares. We're going to call that S hat, which is a function of delta, with observed market shares S. And they came up with this algorithm. It's going to seem kind of like a similar algorithm to, to things we've, we've done in the past in this class. We're going to start with some initial arbitrary constant values, delta zero, delta zero. Use those to predict uh, market shares for each product and market. Then compare that predicted value with the real value. And in fact, we're going to compare it in this kind of way right here. It's the log of the ratio. And then adjust each one of our delta terms based on this kind of iterative procedure here. We're going to either move the delta up or down depending on whether our predicted value is too low or too high. And we're going to do that for all of our deltas. And we're going to keep doing that, repeating over and over again, trying new deltas, comparing predicted and observed market shares, trying new deltas, new uh, predicted and observed market shares, until we converge to that unique set, that delta hat, that equates observed and predicted market shares. That's going to be the unique vector of deltas that defines these product market uh, constant terms. And once again, there could be thousands of these, and this would have been infeasible to do in the kind of standard mixed logit estimation setup, but they can do it this way using what they call the contraction mapping, showing that there's this kind of one-to-one -one mapping between deltas and uh, market shares, and then that they created this algorithm that will get us there. So that's a big piece of estimation, but remember that's only getting us delta. We have, we, we actually care about other parameters in our model. We have theta parameters that we care about and we have these beta bar parameters that we care about. So that's really just one piece of the estimation. I think we've actually kind of talked through all of the pieces at various points now. So let's put it all together and describe exactly how the BLP estimation procedure works. It's two steps. The first step, remember, is finding those thetas and deltas. And we can think about this as actually a nest of two loops. In the outer loop, we're trying to find the set of thetas that optimize our estimation objective function, whether that's a log likelihood function or some moments. We wanna find the, you know, the, the right set of thetas. Within that, for every different set of theta that we try, we're gonna have this inner loop of the contraction mapping that we just described. So we're gonna have kind of these nested algorithms where the first step within each iteration of that outer estimation where we're trying to find theta, the first step is we have to use these thetas in the contraction mapping algorithm to get to deltas. Once we've done that though, we have to do it every time, but every time we do that, and, and BLP showed that that's feasible and a correct way to do things. Now we've got thetas and deltas. We can use those to simulate choice probabilities. Once we have choice probabilities, we can use that to uh, either put together a lot likelihood function or moments. And that's the thing we're trying to optimize over in this first step. So in some sense, this is, this is very similar to what we're used to with like a mixed logit model. It's just that instead of estimating delta as part of this outer loop, we've got this kind of extra dimension of the estimation algorithm where we're gonna estimate those deltas using this contraction mapping inside that loop. But once we've done that, we've got our thetas. And then once we have thetas, we have deltas. Now we can estimate beta bar by regressing delta on those prices and other attributes instrumenting for price with uh, some vector z. Turns out we can actually do this two ways. We can either use maximum simulated likelihood for step one, solve that, take the results of that and use it in step two with two stage least squares. Or we can construct some moments for step one, 
construct some moments for step two, and then just simultaneously estimate all of those moments. So this video is getting long, uh, but let me quickly say what each of these estimation methods will look like. I've just got one slide on each, so we're almost done. If we want to use the first option with method of simul, uh, uh, sorry, uh, maximum simulated likelihood and two-stage least squares, then our maximum simulated likelihood estimator, our theta hat, is going to be the set of parameters that maximizes our simulated log likelihood function. But remember, in trying to solve this thing, in order to calculate these choice probabilities, we also have to know those deltas. So there's kind of like a delta calculation embedded in here. But once we know those theta hats, that's going to imply a unique vector of delta hat. Once we know delta hat, then we can estimate beta bar by regressing delta hat on our prices and non-price attributes with two-stage least squares where we instrument with some uh, exogenous instruments Z. And if we're just identified there, that's going to give us the two-stage least, esti two least squares estimator given here. If we're over-identified, things get a little more, uh, the, the notation gets a little more messy, but the same, the idea is the same. We, you know, the, the second stage is just, or second step is just two-stage least squares. The alternative is to construct some moments. We've got two sets of population moments. This first set, and I say set here because if Z is, if we have more than one instrument, which, which we pretty much always will, then, then Z, then we actually have uh, this first equation here corresponds to the dimensionality of Z. The second equation also corresponds to the dimensionality of Z. So we've kind of got like two times Z moments here, two times the dimensionality of Z. The first moment says in our population, are econometric residuals of the choice problem itself. So comparing the choice to choice probabilities, that should be orthogonal to our instruments. And also that in our second step, when we compare deltas kind of at, at, the, at the product market average utility level, the uh, residual or the error term there should be orthogonal to our instruments. So we've got two different things that should be orthogonal to our instruments, our, our choice econometric residual and that kind of second uh, linear regression residual. Both of those should be orthogonal to our Zs. So then our method of simulated moments estimator, which is gonna be a theta, a set of theta hats and a set of theta, uh, sorry, beta bar hats. We've got these stacked beta bar hat thing going on here. That's going to be the set of parameters that solves all of these moments simultaneously where we plug in the empirical analog instead of the population moment. So we're going to do this all just in one big estimation instead of the two steps that we talked about previously. Uh, of course, this works if we're just identified. If we're over identified, then we're instead doing like a GMM thing where we're actually minimizing the weighted sum of squared moments instead of uh, actually solving these. But in either case, we're going to use kind of method of simulated moments here to uh, to, to, to find the parameters that, that solve these these moments or, or minimize these moments. So that was it for BLP. That was a lot. Um, sorry that video ran so long, but I wanted to get through it just so in the future when you see BLP estimation used, you have some idea of what was actually going on in that, in that estimation. In the final video, we're going to talk through one more estimation method, the control function model, uh, which will get at the same endogeneity problem in a different way. And we'll talk through that in the final video here.